Good morning, everyone. Today is January 11th, 2024, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food Project, founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in 2020. Every week, we're delighted to bring you another cutting-edge webinar designed for mediators, arbitrators, lawyers, and everybody who negotiates. As you know, there's no charge for these great programs. Rather, we ask you to contribute to a food bank if you're in a position to contribute and you like what you see. And one of my favorite parts of the program every week is when we announce the running total of just how much our generous audiences have contributed in honor of our great speakers since the series began. Natalie Armstrong Motan, would you please do the honors? Hi, Jeff. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thanks for joining us, Neil. Thanks, everyone else, for joining us. But thanks especially to the Resolution Industry for your generous donations. As of this morning, people have let us know about $506,240.81 in donations to food banks around the world. This makes a tremendous difference to families in need. So if you make a donation, please send us an email, send us a message, let us know what your donation is. And we would love to join uh, your donation with all the others. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Natalie. And we have a great program this morning. Neil Chatterjee will be presenting, talking about his best and worst experiences in mediation. Neil is one of Silicon Valley's most prominent attorneys, litigators. He's a partner in the Silicon Valley office of Goodwin Proctor LLP. He's ranked in chambers nationally, not just in one, but in several categories. He has extensive experience mediating with mediators of all shapes and sizes all over the country, if not all over the world. We're very much looking forward to hearing lessons from him that we can all put to work in our very next mediations. Neil, please tell us a little about the food bank to which you would like people to contribute if they're in a position to do so. And then on with the presentation, Neil Chatterjee, the floor is yours. All right, thanks a lot, Jeff. I really appreciate you having me here today. And uh, it's great to see so many people um, showing up for this as well as uh, supporting uh, food banks all over the country. Uh, let me uh, just mention, I'm actually gonna mention two different food banks and one is non-obvious. Uh, uh, I do patent litigation, so non-obvious is a phrase that I sometimes use. Uh, but uh, the first one is one that a lot of people know about. It's the Second Harvest Food Bank of Silicon Valley. It's one of the largest uh, providers in Silicon Valley. And uh, it's near and dear to my heart uh, just because it's it's where I live. It's in Silicon Valley. But the other food bank does something very counterintuitive. A lot of you might have heard of humane societies. And most people think of it as a place where you go and you adopt a puppy or a kitten or a rabbit, uh, sometimes even uh, iguanas or uh, exotic animals like that. Well, the, I sit on the board of the Humane Society of Silicon Valley. And one of the concepts that they have is that animals can provide important support to the social and emotional health of families and to unhoused communities. And so one of the things that they do is they actually provide a pet pantry. So for people who can't afford to feed their own pets, there's a program that the Humane Society offers that provides free pet food for families with animals. So in addition to Second Harvest, if you are interested um, in, in, uh, in, in also doing something a little more interesting, a little, a little different, uh, go to the Humane Society of Silicon Valley. And I saw your, your link, uh, Natalie, I think um, Humane Society of Silicon Valley is um, hssv.org. Um, but that's another place uh, where uh, it provides an important food bank-like service. So uh, with that, uh, Jeff, should I, I go ahead and maybe uh, share some observations? So um, I thought I would start by just kind of talking about um, some concepts around mediation, and then I'll go to some of the war stories of the best and the worst. Uh, and then uh, and then maybe I'd open it up for Jeff to ask some questions and others to ask questions at all. I'll probably talk for 10 to 15 minutes or so if that, um, if that works for everyone. Um, from a mediation perspective, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, everyone always submits their either confidential or joint statements or a little bit of both. 
But one of the questions that mediators don't always ask in the submission is the question of, and, and that, you know, that, that submitted is why now? Why is now the time that you're mediating? What is the timing issue that's driving the desire to have a discussion? Um, I think that is uh, an important question to ask in framing what the expectations of the parties are going to be. Sometimes people are doing it right just because there's a court order. And other times people are saying the evidentiary records developed. Sometimes people are saying it's because it's the very beginning of a case and they want to try and avoid the expense if they can avoid it. Um, but all of those things actually inform the motivations of the parties and frame how a mediator might want to work with the parties. Um, and I've just been surprised because the why now often plays a significant role in the mediations, but it's actually not one of the elements that's kind of in the in the statement that people um, often have to submit. The second thing that I think is important is um, who are the people in the room and what is their level of sophistication? Um, a lot of times in a big commercial dispute or a big IP dispute like I handle, you might have a CEO or you might have a CFO or even a general counsel. Um, and sometimes they have a lot of litigation experience. And this is just another day at the office. And sometimes they're a 26-year-old founder of a company that's never seen litigation before and believes that any time they settle a case, it's an admission of wrongdoing or an admission that the, that, that the claim was without merit or something like that. There's also important issues that get affected by culture. Now, I don't want to be so presumptuous to say every country has a universal way of negotiating. But in my experience, when I'm dealing with a Taiwanese company, the way that they could generally go about decision making and their general philosophy of how litigation works and what um, outcomes might be acceptable and the way that they negotiate do have some consistent patterns. And it's very different than if you're working with a company that's Israeli or a company that is Korean. And it's also very different from if it's a Chinese company or a Japanese company. And in, in the United States, you kind of see um, um, all of these different mindsets kind of uh, uh, come in. Um, and, and knowing kind of uh, the cultural background of how people might enter a negotiation is important. It's also important to kind of understand Commercial disputes can sometimes actually feel more like family disputes. Um, as an example, I do a lot of work with founders of companies where the founders have decided to separate and go their own way. Even though intellectual property and shareholders issues and corporate issues might be driving the dispute, when you sit in the room with the people, there's really a lot more emotion behind it. And it's more like the company is our baby and we're fighting over what the custody rights should be. And understanding those motivations and who the people are in the room and what the cultural backdrop is can really make a material difference in framing it. And I do think it's helpful to actually ask the parties that question because a lot of times lawyers don't think about it. Um, they don't think necessarily about is the driver something other than just pure economics. Um, the final thing, and this is something that's relatively new, um, particularly on larger commercial disputes, is, is asking the question of what are the structural obstacles to resolving the case? And I'm going to give two examples as structural obstacles, but there are many, many, many more. So the world is changing significantly in a world of financial instruments associated with litigation. Um, an example would be litigation funding. Now, most people think that litigation funding is entirely passive or often very, very passive, where you know a funder gives money and is expecting some kind of a return off of it. But even if the funder is expecting a return off of it, it can present a structural obstacle because the person who's settling may or may not be able to get much money if they're having to give a ton of money back to the funder. Or... A funder may be passive, but might say, if you settle a case for $10 million or below $20 million, any amount that you settle for will be treated as if it was $20 million, which will have significant financial impacts on, on the company settling. Those could be very big structural obstacles because there's someone that isn't sitting in the room that does provide a barrier to settlement. Another example would be a most favored nation status and a license agreement 
on a third party agreement where you can't do something more favorable than what a most favored nation status will be. The other thing that comes up is increasingly, and it's still a fairly niche market, people are sometimes trying to insure against the outcome of a case. So they might have a verdict or they might have a damages model and they get an insurance product that basically will pay them whether or not that verdict uh, is sustained. And uh, it won't be the entire amount, but it'll be a certain percentage of the amount. Um, again, uh, what that does is if someone has an insurance policy, the amount of money that they would get from the insurance company on the outcome of a case, as opposed to insurance policies for defendants, can create a, 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 a floor for what a party is willing to settle for. And again, you have the structural obstacle. And in Rule 26 and a lot of the disclosure requirements, that kind of insurance policy is not necessarily discoverable in litigation. So um, these structural obstacles can often um, influence outcomes in ways that, you know, parties aren't always great at disclosing them, um, but really pushing hard to figure it out is important. So you don't waste anyone's time when you're sitting in the mediation room. Now, let me, uh, maybe I'll turn to some um, war stories. Um, I actually think, well, let me start with um, kind of the the bad, uh, the, 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 you know, um, uh, the, the bad mediation stuff. And honestly, I'll say it's more often because of um, opposing counsel uh, and and how the other side has prepared for the mediation more than it is the mediation mediator themselves. Um, particularly when you are dealing with companies that are not familiar with the mediation process or uh, 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 relatively unsophisticated business executives, at least in a litigation context, um, a conversation that will sometimes come up um, in, 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 in the private meetings before we, we go and mediate is the, is the comment to uh, counsel, wow, that sounds like it's going to be really boring and there's not going to be a lot of value creation in the time that we spend. Because the way especially venture capitalists and startup people think about things is they think about each hour they spend as opportunity cost. And if they're spending an hour in a mediation room waiting for the other side to come back with a proposal and they can't be going and doing stuff to create value for their company, they feel like they've lost the opportunity to go and help build their company so they can you know, hit whatever benchmarks there are on the next founding round. And that, um, particularly with founders and particularly with senior executives um, at companies, that opportunity cost is considered very, very material and worth millions and millions of dollars. That is something that really needs to be managed before you go into the mediation. And it's probably something that would could be better acknowledged by mediators during the mediation, um, because that opportunity cost is uh, is significant. And so, some of the times that I've been in mediations where things have gone really awry, is the other side just starts, you know, really complaining about how long it's taking, and getting really antsy to get out of the room, because they didn't manage the executives right at the beginning. Um, uh, just as a, as a funny story, um, you know, I represent a lot of startup people who are relatively young. And uh, uh, in a couple instances, uh, uh, some, of the, some of the younger people have asked if they could um, bring things to occupy themselves uh, at, the, uh, at the mediations, things like video games um, or um, their significant other or things like that because they really didn't want to be stuck with a bunch of suits sitting in a room all day. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, I think it's important to recognize the value of time and the opportunity cost, because um, at least when I've seen things go really bad, it is often tied to that, even though people don't realize it. And it's an important thing um, to acknowledge. Um, the other thing, there's two other really bad things um, that I would say that they're kind of war stories. 
one is you sit in a room all day and you're, you're kind of, you know, working with the mediator, you're educating them about, you know, all these different issues in the case, whether it's about the merits or these other dynamics. And the mediator just comes back as kind of a, a an initial or a, 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 a core proposal and offers the split the baby approach. Um, generally speaking, that is a terrible idea because, the, you know, especially for us, when we are when we are working with clients to get them to go to the mediation and they're talking about these opportunity costs and sometimes they're resistant, other times they're not. Um, and then they, you know, we, we always have to kind of justify the fees to the, uh, to the client on, 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 on why should, why should we be paying for the mediation? If the only thing that comes in is saying, okay, I heard you on all of these merits. I know there were these presentations and the like, um, uh, let's let's split the baby. Uh, they say, is that really value creation for us? That's, uh, you know, did that person really hear us? Did they really understand the dynamics, um, or are they just taking the easy way out? Um, and again, when they're spending money on me or they're spending money on you, what they're looking for is what is the value creation for them that comes out of it? And split the baby dilutes that at some way. Um, related to that, uh, I, I will talk. Let's talk briefly about opening statements. Um, I've seen, I've had a couple mediations go horribly awry when you do opening statements in a joint session, and I've even had one instance where someone, the other side, came in. They took an extremely aggressive um, approach, you know, kind of pointing their finger, saying they're going to prove that uh, my client's a liar, this and that. Um, and uh, I've seen people stand up and walk out and leave. Um, I do not like opening statements uh, at, uh, to each side. I don't mind giving them to uh, the mediator. And I also don't mind if farther along in the process where people are getting towards yes, if there's a reason to do it, doing an opening statement in the middle of a mediation, if it makes sense. But I don't like doing them at the beginning. When, I, when you do them at the, at the beginning, um, to just the mediator, it's really important for the mediator to demonstrate knowledge of the case. Um, I've had three different times where I'm in a mediation where the mediator confused the case that, that was in front of them that day, and they were actually talking to us about some other case they had handled the day before or a discovery hearing they had going on. That's a disaster. Um, and I know that's, you know, like Jeff looks really surprised. Wow, that happens. Um, but yeah, it happens. Um, and, and so, you know, it, it, it's really important. Um, uh, there are a couple of mediators who insist on opening statements. And I found that those are effective when, first of all, people are conditioned not to do fire and brimstone and to be respectful. And secondly, when the mediator restates the party's position back to them with everyone in the room to demonstrate that they understand what the case is about. Um, whether or not you're going to be doing, you know, more of the um, non-evaluative techniques in mediation, understanding the case and the party's position is something that people just want to know has happened. They just want to know that that, that has actually occurred and that you actually understand it. One other thing associated with that, and just listening to, to people, a lot of times, even in commercial disputes, people just want to tell a, t a neutral their side of the story. And, uh, you know, I think most mediators I have are pretty good at this, but being a really good listener um, can make a huge, huge difference. Um, let me give a couple examples of uh, mediations that have worked really, really well. And I thought I would talk about some non high stakes litigation ones, but they, I really, they were very memorable to me. Um, I do a lot of pro bono work and, and, and they're very memorable to me. And I thought they were really good examples. In one case, um, there was a, a woman uh, and, a, and a man who had been separated and they decided that um, they were going to try and reunite. And they they uh, got a hotel room in a very, very nice hotel. And we're kind of gonna do a getaway weekend together, romantic getaway weekend to kind of reunite. They go into the hotel and they were, um, they, they were African-American and something happens at the hotel and in the middle of the night, the hotel kicks them out. They weren't fighting or anything. There was some issue and they got kicked out and they were not refunded their money and they sued for discrimination. And in the mediation, um, and there, there were some facts that would indicate that there was 
potentially some discriminatory acts occurring. But in the mediation, what really, you know, what really bugged them was not necessarily the facts that lawyers can can use to try and prove discrimination. The thing that really pissed them off was the fact that this was a big day for them. And they felt like the hotel robbed them of that, that they didn't get that reunification, you know, great weekend. So the mediator said to the to the hotel, I, I don't know what, what they said because I was I was representing the parties, said kind of, you know, um, could you give them the presidential suite for two nights and maybe give them an all expense paid trip, um, you know, just to stay or an all expense paid stay at your hotel and just give them the royal treatment um, or at one of your other sister hotels. And they're like, yeah, sure. It's not, I mean, that was not huge skin off their back. And they, and they said, you know, we, in, in the mediation, it kind of was presented as a little bit of an apology. Like, we're sorry we ruined this weekend for you. We know it was really important acknowledgement of those feelings. And they put it on the table where they're going to get a better room than they ever would have got before. Like that, the case settled. Um, and I really thought the mediator did a very effective job to getting to the heart of what was the driver of the dispute. Um, there was another one that I handled. I do a lot of um, civil rights cases uh, for prisoners in the federal court system. And uh, and those cases are a little bit wacky because people who are serving life sentences, like some people would say, why can they sue the government um, and ask for money, especially when they don't really need money because they're in prison for a long, long time. Um, and uh, we have very interesting dinner conversations with my kids about um, about how these cases should get resolved if they should if they're even allowed at all. And uh, this particular case, I actually have the letter from the client sitting back in my office as a reminder every day of the importance of our work. There were really bad facts about officers um, in the prison engaging in some really bad conduct with. Um, my client, who was one of the prisoners. Uh, the undisputed facts were, were that he was being transferred from one facility to another facility. He was put in a holding area, which is kind of like a telephone box. That's an entirely enclosed area. And for some reason, when he went into the, the box, um, he had his, all of his hearing in both ears. But when he left the box, they had done some things. And uh, and there were the, the police officers had done some things when he was fully restrained. And he left without hearing in one of his ears. Um, and uh, and it, the officers who did it had been subject to prior complaints by him about some mistreatment issues. Um, the mediator uh, went in and and you know when you when you're dealing with prisoners, there's always this kind of feeling of you know prisoners are going to complain about their treatment, and there's some degree of skepticism. Um, and, you know, empathy doesn't necessarily play in the same way because a lot of the people you're dealing with are not necessarily the nicest people. Um, and this client, I mean, I, in many ways, I love him. He, he actually wrote some of the best briefs I've, I, I've ever seen as a, you know, not even high school graduate. He says to the mediator, look, I've done a lot of horrible things in my life. I've been involved in prison riots. I'm serving a life sentence for attempted murder. I've been in gangs. And he said, but sometimes, you know, people like me can still have things happen to them that are really bad that were undeserved. And he articulated it. And um, in that instance, the mediator said, I want you to meet with the head of the of the prisons. I want you to tell me, tell them exactly, or you know, the person with the son, I want you to tell them exactly what you just told me and 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 to walk through it. And uh, and we settled the case. And uh, in, in this letter, the client actually wrote me. Uh, and it was a very substantial amount of money for them. Um, uh, and uh, the client wrote me, basically, he's keeping the money for if he ever gets out. And if he doesn't get out, he's going to use it to help pay for his kid's college. Um, and, you know, that was just like so rewarding to be able to do that. And that was, again, like that was a time when the mediator figured out, OK, if I can just get these two people together in a way, you know, this was the time was by phone because the guy was in prison. But if I can get them together by phone to actually have him say, I accept accountability for a lot of the bad stuff I've done, but this one was over the line. It wasn't about that. Um, it made a material difference. And um, I really thought the mediator did a very good job on kind of smoking out 
um, where where there were obstacles to settlement, but trying to understand the the people that were involved to um, to help bridge that gap and get the case resolved. So with that, I mean, those are kind of some of the examples. Um, um, I'll, I'll do one final one, which is the persistence of mediators after mediation. A lot of my cases will not settle in the meeting itself. Um, the persistence afterwards of kind of saying what's going on and just checking in um, uh, and trying to, you know, getting the mediators take a little bit on the personalities involved can be very, very helpful in trying to uh, to resolve disputes. So with that, Jeff, I'm going to turn it back to you, open it up to questions. I see there's like tons of stuff in the chat. I haven't been reading them, but I'm happy to. We'll, we'll, we'll get to all of it, Neil. This is all very helpful, very provocative stuff. Thank you so much. So the first thing that kind of just jumps out, leaps out at me here, is that you say that uh, with the these entrepreneurial founders, the other uh, high, very super high achievers you're dealing with in Silicon Valley, on the one hand, you say they want to be free every minute to create value for and wealth for their investors and themselves. On the other hand, you say some of them want to know whether they can bring video games to the mediation. Not exactly a value creating activity unless you deem uh, collecting points in the video game the creation of wealth. You say that the people are frustrated that mediations take so long, and indeed sometimes they do. And then in the next breath, you say, well, when a mediator comes in and says, look, why don't you just split the difference and go back to creating value that'll far outstrip the amount that you sacrifice in the negotiation, they don't like that either. So how do you square some of those circles? It's, yeah, it's it's actually really simple. It's knowing the audience, right? Uh -huh. Like, like there, there's always going to be these benchmarks of people in different um, different areas um, and, you know, knowing your audience. Because like, if you're dealing with, I'll give an example, let's say a Series C company that's got 100 million, 200 million in investment and they're looking towards IPO. The At that point in a company, they're gonna look at a lot more of opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. In a series A or series B startup with a kid who got was lucky enough to get funded coming out of college or you know, maybe um, you know, uh, uh, someone who really has not worked a whole lot, they're gonna be more of the video game uh, profile. But yeah, you know, they could have been very, very lucky, um, you, you know. And it just it's it's heavily dependent on the specific audience involved and asking the question, what's their motivation and what are these people like? And those questions, Neil, need to be asked before the mediation takes place, right? As part of the preparation process. I, I think it needs to be asked before the mediation takes place between the lawyer and the clients, and they need to understand their people. But then also, I think the mediator needs to have, you know, like, if possible, have kind of private sessions with the lawyers about, okay, tell me a little bit about these people, you know, like, how are they going to feel being here? Or what are the concerns they've expressed? So my sense is that in every mediation, a mediator has to have some communication with the lawyers in advance because lawyers are not comfortable and not particularly skilled in putting that sort of thing in writing in a brief. And certainly you wouldn't want to take a chance on your client reading something that might create some embarrassment. So can you go through the steps of what you think constitutes proper preparation for a mediation, both in terms of from the from the lawyer's perspective, with but with particular emphasis on the coordination between the lawyers and the mediators before the actual mediation, quote unquote, the quote unquote mediation day. Yeah. Well, so it's very different if you're working with like a company where there's an insurance coverage or you're working at a you know with a company that has 300, you know, in-house litigation attorneys or something like that, right? That's just a totally different, much more sophisticated, much more uh, simple calculus, a lot easier to do because, so I'm, I'm talking really about 
the types of people where they don't have a whole lot of litigation experience or they they can be less sophisticated on how this works and what how to manage risk and and, and things like that um so a, a big chunk of it is uh you know the, the the attorneys meeting with the clients ahead of time and and also they've been working with them while so they know them but most of the time when you're doing the pre-meeting with mediators you're not meeting with the mediators individually normally it's like a joint session where you kind of do a call with the mediator and opposing counsels on the phone i am not necessarily going to be as open there saying look my client is really loony and if you say the following three things they're going to fall off the rails and they're going to scream at you and they're going to walk out of the room or um, one of the people we're not bringing to the mediation is a person who will draw really hard lines in ways that it's going to be counterproductive to settlement. But privately, I might say some of those things to you, right? I might say, look, we're being very strategic in who we, we're bringing. These people are the more rational thinkers or, you know, but there are board dynamics or other senior executives that we have to deal with. Um, and we have to figure out how to manage those internal politics um, to get this case to resolution. All of those things are important things to tell you in your arsenal, but I'm not necessarily going to do it with the other other side there. I might even not even do it with the client there, right? And so I do think at least inviting uh, people to have a private session uh, with the mediator in advance, really driven towards the personalities and cultural issues involved can be very helpful. Well, I, I agree entirely, Neil. And I think it's not just best practice, but pretty much required practice for mediators to get on the phone or on a Zoom with the lawyers, each lawyer separately, to try to ferret out those issues of personality and temperament and what are the what are the hot button words that you must avoid and what has already been attempted and failed uh, with a with a particular client. Yeah. So let's talk about matching up personalities of mediators with the personalities. There's no one mediator who's right for every case. We all have different temperaments, personalities, backgrounds, et cetera. But when your side of the case is one type of person, say from one culture or one personality type, and the folks on the other side are radically different in their culture, their personalities, how do you try to find how do you try to select mediators in those kinds of cases where a single approach may not be equally effective with, with both sides or all sides? Yeah, so um, it, w w in those circumstances, you know, the hardest part is trying to figure out where can there be areas of common ground. And there are some mediators that will you know, kind of their standard practice. And I'm not saying this is always the right answer for anyone by any stretch, but there are some mediators that will do icebreakers at the beginning where they get every, like, you know, normally you have the joint session and people are reminded of confidentiality, then you go off to your separate corners. There are some mediators that'll say, I want everyone to, we, I just want everyone to say hello to each other in the room. And the, let's just say who each person is, even going down to, um, to, to, you know, the most junior level lawyer, and I'd like everyone to share a little known fact about themselves. And or another one uh, suggested that um, we not talk about the case, but when we have our lunch break, let's just have lunch together. And I really think that in certain circumstances, that's really helpful because humanizing the dispute and letting and, and relationship building can be a critical issue there um, on 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 bridging those gaps. You know, um, th th there was one that I, I I went to, and one of the people said in these icebreaker questions, "Oh, uh, yeah, a little in fact, people don't know about me. Um, my uh, my dad had a second family, and they made a Hallmark movie about me. Like that literally happened, <laughs> and." And and the the case ultimately settled because everyone was fascinated by that fact, and everyone all of a sudden, where they had no common ground, they found common ground under this you know kind of People magazine like question. 
Yeah, fascinating stuff. So, Neil, you talked about uh, people from different countries, different cultures operating differently, and nobody wants to engage in rank stereotyping and right. that that sort of thing. That's considered bigotry nowadays. And we want to treat everybody as an individual, and yet there are different cultures between different countries, different societies. How do you personally try to balance that? Yeah, I mean, what I try and do is I try and say how, try and understand how are decisions made within your organization? And what are your, um, what are your biggest concerns? And, you know, I, I've done a lot of work for Taiwanese semiconductor companies, for example. And generally speaking, um, and again, this is not racial stereotyping, it's corporate philosophy. Most of the Japanese, most of the Taiwanese semiconductor companies have a lot of mobility between each other. So because the people have gone from one company to another or are all kind of in the same, you know, same universe, they just have adopted similar processes towards decision making. And um and, and and they have the same the way that they become competitive globally is roughly the same way they you know roughly the same way, and so you know you say well, um, how do you feel about having your um, witnesses fly from Taiwan to the United States for a patent infringement case and testifying in court? That's going to have to happen. That's going to tell you one way or another about you know are they. Um, uh, what their philosophy is, you know, in the United States, you even will get, you know, we'll get some constructive feedback on those questions, but different countries um, and, and and companies from different countries will have much stronger views. You know, some, com some companies will have a much stronger view on, you know, settlement for convenience versus settlement for merit. Um, and, uh, and a lot of that is informed by the, uh, the, 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 legal infrastructures of those particular countries and how ADR is viewed there and what the country's tradition is. Uh, Jeff, you and I both do a lot of work in India, right? And in in media, you know, mediation and ADR in India is a very new thing. Um, and, you know, I mean, my grandparents who died 40 years ago are still involved in litigation in some courts in India um, because the process works so slow, right? Um, and, uh, and, and most disputes are family disputes, um, even if they're not technically family disputes and that cultural background, I mean, I don't think it's bigotry, but it's the framework in the world that they live in on how their legal systems work. And it informs the way that they look at resolution. So, you know, let's talk about the opening joint sessions and it's, you talk about some of the bad experiences that you've had, and I think everybody can talk about bad experiences where a mediator, without properly preparing people, sits folks down in a room and goes, uh, Lawyer A, what do you think? And then Lawyer B, what do you think? And lawyers don't know what else to do other than make the kind of uh, aggressive opening statements they might make to an arbitrator or in a courtroom. My experience is that in good mediation, as part of the prep session, a mediator will talk to the lawyers about whether there is some sliver of the case, some keystone issue, one or two important issues that could be discussed productively in a joint session that would set the stage for later caucuses and would not have the uh, inflammatory potential as just asking lawyers to haul off and state their case. Is it your experience that mediators are working with lawyers in advance to prepare better agendas for joint sessions? Um, no, <laughs> in a word. I. I, I, I think um, I, I, part of it's because of the nature of disputes I work with, right? Um, uh, part, part of it's because of the nature of the disputes I work with is that, you know, it, 
I'm always dealing with a penumbra of facts where some of them are good, some of them are bad, and some may even be god awful. Um, and sometimes there's just core legal disputes, like you know, legal legal mm -hmm. differences of opinion on things. And um, and and it's it's hard to identify those narrow kernels because you know, as advocates, you kind of you know, you 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 kind of want to you build a narrative that you're going to be presenting in your case, and the facts kind of circle around it, um, and they're used. You know, the facts are used to support um, that that larger narrative. There have been times where a mediator might say, "Well, can you can you maybe give like a little bit of a mock opening of what that would look like?" Um, and uh, and then, but let me interrupt and ask questions and try and poke holes on some of the weaknesses. I have generally not found that too productive. Um, uh, if the lawyers are doing their jobs, they're going to have identified what the weak points are and what the narratives are uh, on the other side. Um, but uh, I haven't found uh, uh, the pre preparation of the joint session. The two areas are are saying how you like to do it, and then if appropriate, like I said, these icebreaker things that you know the judge and the mediator are kind of saying. Look, I like doing a mediator, uh, this kind of icebreaker thing. What do you do about that? What has worked, actually, as I think about it, one of the things that has worked well is if you get in the joint session and the mediator says, you know, to the to the plaintiff, here's what I understand your position to be, having rev reviewed the papers, and says to the defendant, here's what I understand your position to be. There's two sides to every story. And if I missed anything, let's talk about it in private caucus to make sure I really understand it precisely. And that can be very effective because it demonstrates the mediator's understanding of this. And that that legitimacy early on is really important. And not all mediators do that. And you but know, I do think it's material when they do. I'll go ahead. I do think it's material when they do. Like, I think it really matters. It's, you know, the clients will say, wow, I really like this meteor. They really they really seem to understand the case. Well, that's a critical part of preparation by the mediator, isn't it? In order for the mediator to gain the trust of the parties, you don't want to be walking in and confusing today's case with yesterday's discovery hearing or uh, some other some other situation. Yeah, but sometimes you get into a mediation, a mediator will say, okay, let's, we, we, we got to get started on the bidding. You know, I read your stuff. I read their stuff. Let's, let's just get going. And they're kind of, and it's partially because of this time pressure that people feel, uh -huh. but you know, and that's not uncommon to kind of get into it. And then you start talking about details later on. I just think that the mediator's legitimacy by kind of um, summarizing the positions before everyone and demonstrating that they know both of them, we can all disagree on them, but that we know both of them. Uh, in the joint session can be very helpful. And Neil, during the course of the mediation day, is it your custom or preference to have side conferences with opposing counsel and the mediator, perhaps outside of the presence of all clients, but as a way of breaking impasses, getting together with the other lawyer and the mediator and saying, look, we're, we got to do something different here. We're not making any progress. How about it, folks? Have you had uh, that experienced that? Yeah, I've done it. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, like I don't. I don't think there's a universal truth on it, but it can be productive. Um, it really depends on how much the lawyers hate each other. Um, I, I, I mean, honestly, like uh, how acrimonious is the litigation? And and um, there are times where I feel like the lawyers are less interested in settling. The lawyers on the other side are less interested in settling than the clients are. And that's a really tough um, bridge to cross because uh, lawyers can be getting in the way. And sometimes I'll suggest, hey, you know, why don't the principals exchange phone numbers so they can text each other if there's ever anything to talk about? Um, on a business level, and you may not resolve it at the mediation, but even like the exchanging phone numbers thing can be very productive in the longer term. At the level at which you're dealing, Neil, you know, AmLaw 200 firms, international clients, people ranked in chambers, all of that, you still find that lack of civility among lawyers, even at the elevated levels at which you're operating? Completely. 
completely. And, uh, you know, I think if, if you go and you talk privately, well, I'm going to make two observations and I hope one doesn't offend because it's a little bit political. Um, but um, uh, if, if if you talk privately to, you know, arbitrators, to uh, certain judges, they will say there are certain styles of litigation at certain firms and other styles of litigation at other firms. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's just, a uh, you know, civility, um, you know, is not necessarily a mindset of everybody and clients sometimes don't hire for civility. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll just say is in a post Trump world, there has been a significant, a significantly higher uptick in the view of what are called alternate facts. I have seen in litigation that the acrimony and the ability to just kind of, you know, a document says what it says, someone say, someone to just say, no, it doesn't, uh, even though in black and white it's there, the, the liberties that people will take with that has expanded considerably. And it's really disappointing as a litigator to have seen that change and um, because of its prevalence on, on the kind of the political disputes that have been happening in court, um, the courts are giving it more tolerance than they used to. And I, 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 I just, it really, it really, it, it, it hurts me to say that. Like I, because I'm a person who takes great pride in, in kind of making sure we're doing it right and, and, and being you know, being accurate. And and I just gave a presentation yesterday on part of my obligation is authenticity and honesty to courts. That's, there's four jurisdictions I serve, my partners in my firm, the associates and staff I work with, the clients and the court. And, uh, and those are the four vectors of service I live in. And uh, it, it saddens me to see that change. And courts are more tolerant of that? Yes. How does that manifest itself? Um, mo motions for sanctions um, are are filed at the drop of a hat um, a lot more, and so courts have a harder time assessing which ones are real and which ones aren't. Um, courts aren't necessarily calling people out when they're submitting, you know, um, declarations or briefs or things like that that are just not, you know, just completely inconsistent with with uh, documents. Um, or 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 testimony, um, uh, and and they're they're not. Um, I just I just feel like there's there's. Uh, they 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 are, they're they're just not calling it out in the way that they used to. Uh, that's the way I would do it. And 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 also, it wasn't really happening before that much. Now it happens just a lot more. And uh, I don't feel like, you know, in, in I, I don't feel like people are trying to dial it back, you know, and and, and kind of saying, let's all, you know, <laughs> let's all, I mean, like, it's one thing to be a vigorous advocate, or sometimes people, you know, are, are pushing envelopes a little more or less, like, that's all practice stuff. Like, I don't have an issue with that. Like, people are going to do what they're going to do, and they're going to have their philosophy of litigation. But the ability to kind of just come in and, and, and be and really kind of um, live in the world of alternate facts. Um, and, and it makes it harder to settle cases too. So <clears throat> the lawyers who stand in the way of settlement, Neil, if you can generalize, is the motivation to perpetuate the legal fees on a big case? Is it ego? People want to one-up each other. What do you, can you generalize as to what's going on there so that we mediators can be prepared to deal with that better? Yeah, so remember, I spend a lot of time living in the startup world. So one of the biggest things is if you're on the defense side is to try and litigate someone out of existence. It's that, you know, if if we can keep this litigation alive against someone that we don't like or we don't like what they did, can we keep them from being fundable or to have to take extremely reduced valuations on, on whatever funding plan they have? And it, can we interfere with the business enough? That, you know, that's a, that's a huge issue. There's, um, 
existential issues that get manifested through in a one one case, but it actually can have a larger set of policy implications for a company. Those can be obstacles. Um, and then the lawyers, you know, sometimes they they are acting in their own self-interest to keep getting the fees and to keep the case alive. It's a little hard when you're on the other side to know which one of those are they are. Although, you know, if they're repeat um, adversaries that you're facing, you can often figure out who are the ones that are just trying to keep the fees alive. You know, before I open it up to the floor for a couple of questions, we have a few minutes left. You talked about the situation of the guests in the hotel who had a bad experience. And this is a, a sip of the ocean, really, of what we deal with in mediation. I'm interested in your thoughts. I think many times we get into a litigation situation and the plaintiff feels um, they're motivated by a sense of having been disrespected by the people whom they are suing and that they are suing in order to get revenge. And that sometimes, many times, what we're doing in mediation is trying to rewind the tape, if you will, and allow the defendant to show some respect to the plaintiff, dissipating the motivation to seek revenge. And I'm wondering if that's something that you've observed in a more general level as well, what your comments or thoughts are on that. Yeah, and I, the answer is yes, but I'm gonna I'm gonna flip it on you a little bit, Jeff, because oh. um, uh, because yes, that happens. Um, there there is very often a, you know, I'm sure you all have encountered this. You walk into a mediation and the plaintiff doesn't know what they want, and 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 it's the well, I want revenge or I'm really angry. And you know somehow a lawyer let them file a lawsuit without knowing what they really want, <laughs> um, and 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 now they're six months in, nine months in, and they're mediating and they still don't know what they want. Um, uh, I, I've always struggled on that one, like why that happens. On the flip side, and this is where I said I flip it around. I give a presentation um, at the Yale Center for Innovation, or it's got some title like that for startups um, every year. And I talk about the, the 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 three stages of grief of working in a startup. And um, sometimes when you're on the defensive end, the board and the company will say, we can't, they'll have the same emotional response. We haven't done anything wrong. We can't take this sitting down. If we, if we give in to these guys and that'll set a precedent for everyone else who's going to come after us, we need to fight this on principle. That's going to be the statements that you hear. And then, you know, I give my budget, I say how long the case is going to take, and se seven months in, you've spent a million dollars, two million dollars, nothing has happened. There's been no dispositive motions, you've had a lot of discovery skirmishes, and all of a sudden your executives are being pulled into de deposition rooms. And they say, why is this thing around? And you say, you know, well, it's around because you want to fight it on principle, and we couldn't, we, we wouldn't go mediate, deal with it early. And then you're 18 months into the case, and now you're three three million or four million in, and you're at summary judgment stage. And there's always going to be documents that can be spun one way or the other on each side. And you say, you know, you're not you're not going to go to trial for another six months, and you're going to have to spend another million or two to get there. Um, and uh, and uh, and the business is going to be like, who are these people who sued us so long ago, and why have we spent all this money to get here? And we have we made no progress in the case, but here we are just sitting here. And 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 then the business has moved on. It's maybe moved into a different category entirely, but they can't get rid of the darn thing. Well, you know, that's kind of like the, the flip side of your revenge example. It's like at some point that goes away and all you're looking at is how much money you've spent without an outcome. <laughs> and so I, I will say to clients at the very beginning, I just want to make sure you all know how this is going to look 18 months from now. Because this is the stages of grief you're going to go through, and this is where you're going to be. So the option is, do you want to spend three and a half million dollars to get to the point of saying, why are we still fighting this thing? Or do you want to see if there's a pathway to resolving it at the beginning? Because, you know, fighting on principle exists when you're a multi-billion dollar company and you're being hit with 50 million slip, slip and fall cases. Settling on principle, the principle is keep the business operational and focus on build, building the business at the very beginning. That's that's the purpose. And if I'm, you're sucking money out and giving it to me, you are not building the business. You're just helping mine. 
One final, final question for me, Neil. You have a glass wall in your office there, and we've seen a few of your colleagues walking back and forth in the corridor. So I guess people are, at least some people, are working in the office at Goodwin Proctor in Silicon Valley, California. And some people are mediating online and some people are mediating in person. Any thoughts on the pluses and minuses of online and in-person mediation? So I've done both quite a bit. Um, I'll say for arbitration, I don't like online arbitration, uh, which is obviously different than mediation. I prefer in-person mediation for uh, two simple reasons. One is that demonstrates a commitment that parties want to actually try and settle. It's very easy to get on a Zoom call and walk out of a Zoom call. Um, uh, I do think reading body language can be a huge thing in mediations and you can't really do it. That's why I don't like uh, arbitrations. I think, you know, body language, you just don't get the same thing when you're on a Zoom or whatever the video platform is. Um, I have had some cases settle successfully in mediations and mediators have done a good job on doing the shuttle diplomacy. Um, but I just tend to think that that the live, if it's a big enough stakes, it makes sense to do that. Okay, there was a question in the chat about the differences, if any, between uh, mediation when it's forced by a contract, if a con contract stipulates mediation versus people coming voluntarily. Comments on distinctions you see between those two situations. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of those cases where people say you try, like there's an escalation process, like you you have senior executives meet and then you do a, a, a mandatory mediation and then uh, you go to arbitration. I suspect that those might work in things like employment disputes or, um, you know, certain certain types of lower stakes disputes where, you know, it's really important about parties just feeling heard and understanding some of the issues. And my high stakes commercial stuff that I deal with or IP stuff, um, we do it because we're required to and we will often try very hard to settle the case, but it's very, very rarely been successful. There is one thing to know is that courts will throw out cases for lack of jurisdiction if you haven't gone through those hoops, where there, you know, where there are these prerequisites to filing a lawsuit, courts will say you didn't do it, and therefore I'm not going to hear the dispute. And even when parties agree that it could be futile. And I assume the same would be true for court-ordered mediations. If a court orders you to go, people's hearts are not really in it. They're not going voluntarily. Do you see a difference in those cases? I do see a difference in those cases. Those cases um, are often more likely to settle. And I get a lot of settled cases when we have a court order to go do it. Um, the timing isn't always totally right, which can be an obstacle. But a lot of times with clients, and you probably all see this, the clients don't want to ask for mediation because they're worried about looking weak. And the court ordered mediation, which typically doesn't occur before a lawsuit's filed, but you know, it's during a lawsuit, it it kind of gives both sides cover um, to not look weak and say, well, we have to do it. Okay, Neil, we're just about at the end of the time. We've covered almost all of the points that were raised in the chat, and you've had so many very helpful insights. This has just been chock full of helpful information. I'm confident that a lot of people will join Natalie and me in contributing money to Second Harvest of Silicon Valley and the Humane Society of Silicon Valley. And I know that Natalie has uh, got the links to those put back up in the chat. We do hope people will contribute in your honor, Neil. I'm confident many people will. It's been a tremendous presentation. Neil Chatterjee of Goodwin Proctor LLP Silicon Valley, California. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. And with that, we are complete.